So you might ask, why in the world would a mathematician go to Antarctica? The ship left port late at night, sailing for a week through the Southern Ocean. Sometimes you encounter huge waves. Other times it's nice and calm. Uh, we just in how the wave Once we got far enough into the pack, we found our first ice station. As the evening progressed, and all the scientists came out onto the ice to start their experiments, I certainly noticed the ice undulating up and down with a disturbingly large amplitude. And in fact, we had these fluorescent orange bags that would hold safety gear and things like this that were out on the ice. And I often, the, little, the distance, I was watching one of these orange bags sort of go up and down on the ice. And like, like the ice was breathing. The voyage leader was alarmed. He uh, basically called everybody in and said, hey, look, it's time to get off the ice. We're not quite sure of the conditions here. And within about five minutes of that, um, there was a big crack that appeared. Unfortunately, three of our colleagues, three scientists, were stranded on the wrong side of the ice with an ever-widening crack of deathly freezing water between them and the safety of the ship. The initial crack was small. However, the crack was getting wider and wider and wider. So they deployed a rubber bridge. Fortunately, it stayed stable enough for long enough so that the scientists could get back onto the right side of the ice flow. It's one thing to sit in your office and try to uh, prove things about how the sea ice is behaving, but it's a very different thing to actually go down there and see it. Golden has seen it 17 times over his mathematical career trips he considers essential to his work as a mathematician at the University of Utah, work funded in part by the National Science Foundation. We're really interested in uh, the role that sea ice plays in the climate system. Many people say, well, isn't all the math in books? Well, no, it's a very alive and vibrant subject. We are using it every day. When we go to Antarctica, there's all kinds of fascinating mathematics that's, that's being used and that we're developing mathematics that climate scientists now use to improve their projections about the condition of our planet over the next hundred years. In 1994, Dr. Golden was invited on the Ans Flux expedition, his second to Antarctica. And so I was out on the ice um, at around midnight and the, the winds were blowing 40, 50 miles an hour, it was a big storm, and all of a sudden I saw seawater percolating up and just flooding, flooding the surface and making the snow all very wet. And I, in, in an instant, I realized that I thought that what I was seeing was a percolation threshold. Percolation, the flow of water upwards and downwards through sea ice. And um, in that instant, I realized that much of the work that I had done uh, purely as a mathematician over the past 10 years may well apply to this incredibly complicated system that I was there observing. I'm pulling up on it while I, while I break it with this very specially chosen instrument. <laughs> so sea ice, when you look at, when you get down to the microscopic structure, you have little kind of little platelets of pure ice and then with brine inclusion, salty fluid pockets. Fluid may sort of seep down through and find potentially tortuous pathways through this complex microstructure, and we say that the water percolates through this uh, porous microstructure. When the sea ice is cold, most of the salty brine is frozen out. But as the ice warms up, the brine becomes more and more connected. At first, they connect up over very small little air distances, but then this little cluster of connected brine inclusions might connect up with this cluster of brine inclusions over here, and then you have a pathway, a rather short pathway, but then that pathway connects up with longer pathways. And eventually, 
at this critical point, this percolation threshold, you have a pathway within the ice that extends from the bottom all the way to the surface. And the instant at which that happens, that's the percolation threshold. And that's what Golden witnessed when he saw seawater suddenly come up and flood the surface of the ice. And what typically happens is this happens in a storm. When storms come through, they're typically a bit warmer than uh, these cold high pressure systems that you get um, in the polar regions. But what does this have to do with mathematics? Enter Dr. Golden's rule of fives, a rule of thumb that describes the conditions required for percolation to occur in Arctic sea ice. Here, ice crystals mostly grow downwards, forming adjacent columns of single crystals in the sea ice. This is known as columnar ice. Roughly speaking, um, when the amount of brine in the sea ice is less than about 5%, the sea ice is effectively impermeable and fluid will not flow. However, when the amount of brine uh, in the sea ice exceeds 5%, then the sea ice is permeable and there are connected pathways uh, through which fluid can flow. Coincidentally, columnar sea ice has 5% brine when it reaches about minus 5 degrees Celsius for a typical salinity of 5 parts per thousand. Above minus 5 degrees, fluid can flow. Below minus 5, it can't. The rule of fives can help climate scientists predict how rapidly Arctic sea ice may disappear. Here's how. In the late spring and early summer, the surface of the sea ice in the, covering the Arctic Ocean undergoes a remarkable transformation from uh, vast expanses of snow-covered ice to complex mosaics of uh, melt ponds and ice. Now, meltwater is dark. It absorbs solar radiation, whereas the white snow and ice, they reflect solar radiation. Just as a dark t-shirt on a sunny day will absorb heat and make you feel hotter, melt ponds of dark water on the surface of the ice pack will also absorb heat from the sun. The more melt ponds that you have on the surface, uh, the more solar energy the sea ice is going to absorb and the, more, and the more it's going to melt. And what determines whether or not these ponds are there or not, or whether or not they grow or whether or not they drain and just create a completely white surface which reflects is the fluid flow properties of the ice underneath these ponds. Golden has been studying the microstructure of sea ice related to these fluid flow properties for more than 35 years. His mathematics, including the rule of fives, explain these properties and could help climate scientists make more accurate predictions about the future of our planet. One of the main challenges of climate science today. So often while we were out on the ice doing our experiments, we'd have visitors. So emperor penguins would come walking up and they would slide up right next to you. I mean, they would get up within one or two feet and they were just so curious. And then you have the little Adelie penguins that would run around very, very cutely. And then sometimes we'd even have seals um, come up and investigate what was going on on their ice. There's still more to study more to know. So you can write all the complicated formulas and equations and theorems you want on a whiteboard, but unless you really go down there and see it, you're not really going to understand what the ice is really doing. So along with penguins and seals in Antarctica, sometimes you just need a mathematician. That's why a mathematician goes to Antarctica.